Okay, so we're going to talk about conservation of linear momentum. And of course, you guys already know this by a different name, right? Newton's second law, F equals MA. Um, the way we're going to talk about it here uh, is in the context of a continuous body. And it, it forms a set of partial differential equations. And so we'll quickly derive them. It's, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, like last time we looked at some, we cut away some portion of the crust. And we said that due to tectonic motion, there's some Tractions. Remember, tractions are like stress vectors. They have units force per unit area uh, that are that are applied to the exterior of the surface of the surfaces of that crust that we cut away. So, I've only drawn one, but understand that's just for one dA. Right? The whole entire exterior surfaces could have tractions applied to them, right? and. We investigated a little infinitesimal cube. Now we didn't talk about it last time, but you know each infinitesimal cube, which really mathematically represents a point in this continuous body, and there are an infinite number of points. It could potentially have a body force that acts on it. Right? So, what's the most common body force for solid materials? Gravity. Right. So. We're just going to draw it as B because there could be other body forces. Um, electromagnetic forces would be body forces. But the most common one in terms of mechanics, of course, is gravity. So we're just going to call it B for now. Right? And we want to write down the statement of conservation of linear momentum. So in words, conservation of linear momentum is that the time rate of change of linear momentum is equal to the forces applied. So the time rate of change of linear momentum. So this little, this little cube, since it's a differential, you know, it, it's a differential volume. It's, it's small, infinitesimally small. It would have some differential momentum dP, where p is momentum. It's a vector, right? And Typically, we, we say that it is the velocity times the differential mass. So velocity, obviously, is a vector. Mass is a scalar. And we're just going to rewrite mass as the density times the volume. Right? And then we could, we could integrate both sides, uh, and then you know, given some initial conditions, see that uh, the momentum vector is equal to this. Assu assuming that there's initially no, there's no initial momentum, so it's zero. Right. So then. Again, in words, the time rate of change of linear momentum is equal to the forces applied. Well, there's the linear momentum. So we just take the time rate of change of that. So that's dp dt, or d dt integral d dv is equal to the forces applied. So the forces applied, and we're talking about all the forces on the whole body, there are an infinite number of little cubes in our body. Right? So we're going to say the integral of rho b. Right? So b, is the body force, also has units, uh, force per unit area. So just like the force of gravity is density times gravity, right? So this is the density times the body force. 
integrated over the volume. So those are the internal forces or body forces, and then we have these external tractions that act on the outside. So that's going to be the integral T dS, where this is you know, some differential surface, some differential area. So these, these act over volumes, this act over surface. Okay, So that's the statement of conservation of linear momentum. Now, what I'm going to do next is only valid for small deformations. Right? So if the deformations are small, then the volume, the change of volume, the time rate of change of volume okay, is small, then we can move that DDT inside. Right? So you can't always do this. Right? If the if the volume were to change over time, then you'd have to use something else to move that inside. Do you know what it, remember what it's called from transport? Remember Reynolds transport theorem? Did you cover that? Reynolds transport theorem? Okay. Well, if you didn't, don't worry about it. <laughs> so technically, if, if, the, if the volume is going to change with time, uh, then you, you can't just move this inside. But we're going to treat it as a s small volume change, as an, an engineering approximation. So then we're going to be allowed to move this DDT inside the integral. And we'll assume that the density is constant. So we have dV dt dV. The second term is not going to change. And then, if you remember last time, for this traction, we developed something that relates that to stress, the Cauchy stress equation. Right? And we said that, you know, remember that was like T is equal to sigma transpose dot N. Or we, if you use the S notation that we use in Zobac, then it would be that. And just to be clear, I'll put two bars over that guy. I try to be consistent that whenever I write a vector, I use an over bar. So if I can see two over bars, that's a, a tensor, or in the case of this class, you can think of it like a matrix. Okay. N is a unit vector. So I'll always, you know, a, a normal, uh, just a plain vector will have a, an arrow over it and a unit vector I use a hat. So I'm going to plug that in to our equation. <coughs> now, how many of you remember Calc 3? Vector calculus. How many of you remember the divergence theorem? So the divergence theorem allows us with certain conditions on the, ve the vector or tensor field, which we don't really need to talk about here, uh, to convert this service integral into a volume integral. Right? And so I'll just write via the divergence theorem. Then we can convert that term. So I'll, I'll rewrite the first two. So this is this nabla. That's the name of that upside down triangle. That it, we typically use that as a gradient operator, right? So the gradient operator 
you should know this from calculus, but if I have uh, the gradient that operates on anything, so you know, I could have a vector or a tensor there or a scalar, right? I'll just use that simple. Then that that equals this. In Cartesian coordinates. Right? So, in, in Cartesian coordinates, where the coordinate system is in x, y, and z, then you know whatever we would have inside the parentheses there, which I just put a dot. But I anything that you put there, this is your gradient operator, right? So then, this dot is just a dot product. Right? So then I just take the the dot product of this with whatever's there. And so, if, if I have a tensor S, which again is like a matrix, and I take the dot product of it with this thing, what do I get? A matrix dotted into a vector gives you a vector, right? So the gradient operator always, you know, if you think about I'm trying not to have too much of a discussion about tensors in this class, but is it, you can you can think about it: scalars, vectors, and tensors, and, and all in, are all in fact ter, you know, tensors, right? So a scalar is in order zero tensor, a vector is in order one tensor, then you have a second order tensor, third order tensor, fourth order tensor. Okay, so the gradient operator always takes you up in order. So if I have a scalar right there, like if I had the gradient of the density, the gradient of the density would be a vector. Right? It takes you up one order from level 0 to level 1. right? If I had a vector right there, so the gradient of, the, of velocity, for example, gives you a second order tensor. Because every, in every location, you'd have a three component vector that you take partial x of, and then partial y, and then partial z. So then you would get a tensor. So the gradient of a vector is a second order tensor. Right? So then the divergence takes you the other way. Right? So the divergence takes you down in order. So the divergence of a second order tensor or a matrix gives you a vector. The divergence of a vector gives you a scalar. And the divergence of a scalar doesn't make sense. Right? It, you can't, you don't really take the dot product of. The divergence of a, the divergence of a scalar is really just the gradient. You, don't, you can't take the dot, really, the dot product of a, a vector with a scalar. Right? That doesn't really make sense. All right. So uh, what's, what's left, this is, again, just what we wrote there. We've just manipulated it. But now all our integrals in terms of volume, and that, this equation, that differential volume, must hold for an arbitrary volume. It doesn't matter what we. Uh, it doesn't matter what we choose for the volume. It must hold. The equation must hold. Right? So in that case, then we can pull out the integrands and get the pointwise equation. And of course, we, you might see that V is also just uh, du dt. So, so V is the first derivative of u, where u is the displacement. So then another way you might write this, you'd see a second order time derivative of the displacement there. Okay. But this guy is called the Cauchy momentum equation. And this is a statement of conservation of linear momentum, F equals ma. For a continuous body, right? And you should see it's it's you know. If I multiply the whole equation by volume, right? Just multiply it by volume, then I have volume times density that gives me mass. Mass times the time derivative of velocity is acceleration, right? So that term is ma. 
right? And then these are forces, right? So again, I told you that's a force per unit volume. So if I multiply by volume, I get force. This guy also has force per unit volume. Okay, so that's conservation of linear momentum. And again, this is obviously a vector. This is a vector. For the equation to make sense, even if you didn't know that the divergence of a tensor is a vector, you'd have to know that for this equation to make sense, unless I made a mistake, that this has to be a vector, right? Because you, you know, each term has to be, if you vector plus a vector equals a vector. And so, while I've written one compact equation, this is actually, our vectors have three components in Cartesian coordinates, right? So this is actually three equations. Right? And so, what I'll show you next is the three equations all written out. I'm not sure why the fractions didn't show up there. These are all fractions. Right. So that's just the three equations now written in terms of the displacement components, u1, u2, u3. You know, sometimes we'll use x, y, z, sometimes we'll use x1, 2, 3. So then, you know, the divergence of the divergence of S, you know, gives you these nine components here. And these are just your vectors. Right? 